Hi, it's Tony from Old River Hard Goods again. Today we're going to be talking about 19th century braces to some degree, but mostly the brace tools and bits that were used with them. I know it's kind of a boring subject, but you need to make holes somehow, so sit back and enjoy. Thanks. Here we have a selection of bits from the 19th century or 1800s. Starting to the left is a center point bit, gimlet bit, spoon bit, lip dogger, a turn screw or screwdriver bit, a wood counter sink, a tapered reamer bit, a metal boring or metal counter sink bit, a pair of twist augers made by 19th century makers, a chair maker spoke pointer, and a chair maker's hollow auger. And I'll be going in, into more detail on these in a bit. First, I want to talk about the types of braces and bit socks these were used in. First, we have wooden bit stocks. The one on the left is unplated, meaning it's made of solid wood. The one on the right is called a plated brace because of the brass plates that have been mounted on the sides. This is used to prevent the, uh, hopefully prevent cracking, which was a common problem with these guys. They both have a brass chuck shell that's lined with steel, and inside is a uh, little tab that's activated by the button to lock the bits in place. And of course the bits are notched on the ends to keep them from falling out of the tool. These were made primarily in England, but there were some American makers as well. On the American side, we also have the iron bit stocks. Uh, this style was patented by Jeremy Taylor of Hebron, Connecticut in 1836. The most commonly found maker of this tool was Increase Wilson of New London, Connecticut, but it was made by several other makers as well. And you see them with the tabs on the underside, the top, or occasionally the side as well. Our English friends also made a similar style to the Taylor pattern called a Scotch pattern brace, although those are usually fancier and have a wooden pad instead of a metal one. Now the difference between a brace and a bit stock is that the bit stock has the chuck as I showed you, whereas a brace has some sort of movable jaw arrangement like these guys do. The one on the left being a Spofford, the other one is, a, is an older Stanley model. Uh, these were actually first popularized by the Miller Falls Company. Okay, first off, we have a center point bit. These are measured, the cut, from the point out to the spur. This one was made by the Booth and Mills Company of Philadelphia, who worked from 1855 until 1870. Properly sharpened, these do a very good job of drilling. They work very fast but they were also used to hollow out wood without going completely all the way through. Here's an old joiner plane. If you look inside, you can see where a center point bit was used to establish the mortise for the toad or the handle. I've seen this on other planes. I've seen it on wooden cases for sharpening stones. I've seen it on old muzzle-loading guns where the lock mortise areas were drilled out using one of these or the patch box, area, patch box areas were drilled out and properly used. They're, they're a very, very effective bit. Center point bits show up in sizes from, I don't know, the smallest, I guess I've seen is around three-eighths of an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch out to some massive ones that'll go to three inches, but uh, 
those are not very common when you get into those super large sizes with these guys. Next we have a gimlet bit. Uh, these were also called gimblets, G-I-M-B-L-E-T bits. Very simple design, simple twist to them. And these were sized in 30 seconds of an inch. So when you see one marked 7, that's 7 30 seconds. I've seen these as small as 2 30 seconds. Biggest one I think I can remember seeing was a 16. I'm not saying in a in a drill bit. Um, bigger ones, of course, were made. Like this style. This is a hand forged one. It's a little bigger. And these I've seen somewhere up to a, an inch in cut. But that's a subject for another day because that's kind of an interest of mine. Next up we have the spoon bit and the lip dogger. The spoon bit has a kind of pointed tip to it. The lip dogger see this has a little bit of a lip at the end spoon bits are handy because not only can you drill in with it but by rotating it from side to side you can actually hollow out the hole from the inside uh, bigger ones like these are used by chair makers for doing green chair uh, green chair making green wood chair making yeah I got it right advantage of a lip dogger like this is that this can drill a true flat bottomed hole or a blind hole. Unlike the center point bit which does leave a little bit of a point in the hole, this one will get you right down to where you want to be. You also see this style in the bigger T-handle augers as well for shipbuilding and uh, barn building and other trades. Here we have a turn screw or screwdriver bit and a wood countersink bit. The turn screw is just more cast steel. The countersink was made by the Buck Brothers Company and back in the 19th century they made both turn screws and countersink bits. Reamer bit. Uh, that one looks to be hand forged but you can see it is notched for bit stock. The end is kind of mushroomed a little bit because sometimes with some of the older braces the bits would get stuck and you'd have to knock them out. The metal boring bit was made by Francis Walters and company but I can't find any information out on them. Now I've had some arguments with people over the years about well no that's just a regular countersink bit it's not that that not that that but that's how they're listed in the old catalog listings if you look close enough so that's what I call them. It does work very well, uh, especially for uh, drilling out ingrain. Properly sharpened, it will eat through just about anything. Here we have a pair of twist drills. Uh, the first patents for these shows up in the, shows up in the 1830s. Russell Jennings got his first patent in the 1855s, and they sort of became popular after. Uh, the Civil War and manufacturing ramped up on them. The upper one here was made by um, Timothy Slack, who, who was a Chester PA bit maker. I know he goes back as far as 1845. The lower one was made by the Job T. Pew Company, and they go back into the 1700s, and the firm lasted well into the uh, beginning of the 20th century as well. More on Pew a little later. A couple of bits that I don't have in stock right now, but are still somewhat common. Uh, the one on the left is a skilliop, another form of tapered reamer, hollow tapered reamer. The one on the right is a turn screw that's been modified for use with the old split nut saws. Uh, while a lot of guys modified their own, they were manufactured. 
Here's an example of what I'm talking about as far as the split nuts go. And the last two items we're going to display today is a chairmaker's spoke pointer. That is used for rounding over the end of a piece of wood very slightly. So then the hollow auger, which is what this one is, is used to form a round tenon on it. Of course, both of these are chairmaker's tools. Hollow augers back in the 19th century were available in fixed sizes. And slowly but surely, there were a number of patented adjustable ones as well. But that, again, is a discussion for another day. And this is a complete box set of job TPU bits, my personal collection. They don't get used much, but it's kind of nice to have around and you don't see too many sets in the box anymore. Okay, got a block of wood clamped to the bench using a Colt patent. 1881 iron clamp. I do sell a lot of those and they work pretty well. First up is with the center point bit. And you can see how easy and quick it's cutting through the wood. And I'm hardly putting any downward pressure down on it. Next up is the gimlet bit. Now the correct way to remove one of these is to keep turning it and lift it out. If you try going backwards, it tends to want to screw itself into the wood. And last, countersink bit. Very effective, very easy. And that's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed my little presentation and uh, maybe even learned something. So stay tuned for the next one and have a nice day. Bye.